Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we wanted to revisit SolarWinds. There's been some more information that has been released since the initial breach. We talked about Sunburst a couple episodes back when it actually happened. And that was the nickname that FireEye gave to the malicious code update in the SolarWinds Orion platform. Microsoft has since renamed it as SolarGate, and the two are used interchangeably to refer to the same thing. So if you see someone refer to Sunburst and then someone refer to SolarGate, it's essentially the same thing, just from different companies. Microsoft has a resource center dedicated to providing information and timely updates to anything related to this, and it's aka.ms slash SolarGate. If you use a SIM, Microsoft Azure Sentinel has updated their rules for a lot of the different connectors. Additionally, there's a post in the resource center focused on post-compromise hunting. If you initially saw any of the IOCs within your environment, I highly recommend going through this post and following the steps to see if there are additional IOCs after the breach. Other sims like Splunk have also put out their own detection rules. So if there's another sim that you use, you should go and update your YAR rules or whatever it is that is used for detection. If you don't have a post or an email from your account team for that particular product, you should definitely reach out to them. For those of you who are interested in reverse engineering, Microsoft 365 Defender Research Team put out a phenomenal article. And this is also in the Resource Center where they break down the DLL file that was inserted as part of the SolarWinds breach. A couple of highlights that I found super interesting. It's definitely worth a read. It's extremely technical. But because the file was digitally signed, it suggested that the attackers were able to access SolarWinds software development and distribution pipelines. We mentioned on our initial show that there were some sources that had showed the attackers had actually breached SolarWinds as early as 2019 and that they were testing their ability to see if they could change the code without getting caught. Microsoft actually found that they were inserting empty classes into the code as updates to see if they were going to get caught. And of course, the attackers took steps to maintain an extremely low profile. The malicious code that they inserted in the final copy in March was extremely lightweight. The Defender Research team found that they used something called a malware added method that ran in parallel threat so that the DLL's normal operations were not altered or interrupted and it ran side by side with the normal code. That method was part of a class which they called the Orion Improvement Business Layer. Sounds very innocuous. It was designed to blend in very well, and the strings that were part of this method were obfuscated to further hide the code. So definitely recommend a read through this article if you're interested in the technical breakdown and the reverse engineering that the Microsoft 365 Defender Research Team put out. Most EDR and endpoint protection solutions at this point now, they have reports or scans that will help detect against the SolarGate or Sunburst indicators of compromise. So in particular, from Microsoft, there's another blog post that we'll link in the show notes that talks about how you can use Microsoft 365 Defender to protect against it. And there's a report in the Security Center that kind of helps you get started on what to look for. And similarly, CrowdStrike also has a SolarWinds vulnerability report as well. And either one of these reports, whether you're using the Microsoft one or the CrowdStrike one, they're going to show you devices that have the compromised SolarWinds Orion application. And there's been a lot of conversation, of course, about how identity is the new control plane for security. You hear that all the time. But Microsoft has enabled the ability where you can stream your Azure Active Directory audit logs with advanced hunting for all customers. And that's now in public preview. And then there's a GitHub that's going to have some of those advanced hunting queries. So you don't necessarily have to build your own. But audit logs, of course, are going to be great for finding examples where something changed, like a setting or a configuration. And 
tracking that down and potentially backing that out if it is not something that's desirable. And as long as we're on the identity train, and we're going to go a little deeper on that in just a second, but there's some attacks coming through ADFS like stolen or forged SAML tokens, modifying federation trust, that sort of thing. And so there's also some alerts out there as well that will help notify you if those sorts of things are happening. Piggybacking off of the identity topic, Alex Weiner wrote a fantastic article that's also in the SolarGate Resource Center from Microsoft, which is titled Understanding SolarGate's IOCs for Identity Vendors and Their Customers. It's a great article to read if you're interested in how modern identity works. He goes through what it means to forge SAML tokens and how the trust relationship works between the identity provider and service providers. What I found interesting, as Adam mentioned, is that Microsoft reviewing the attack and in their investigation basically says in this article that they have detected activity related to possible SAML token forging, as well as anomalies within Microsoft 365's API access, indicating that the attacker might have added administrative credentials to existing applications or service principles within Azure AD. The article goes through like an attack chain on how an attacker can steal and forge SAML certs. And if you're not familiar with how this works, I found Alex explained it in a really simple analogy. If you can imagine an application being like a music show that you want to go see, you have to have a ticket to the show, and that's the SAML token. The service provider is the ticket taker. The IDP, or the identity provider, is essentially the box office which issues the SAML token, or the ticket in this case. And the signing cert is like the little holograph on the ticket that's supposed to show that the ticket is valid. So if you want to go to the show, you have to go to the IDP, get a token presented to the service provider who then validates the cert or the holograph and it lets you in. And because there's an inherent trust between that service provider and identity provider, as long as that holograph looks good, they're going to let you in. Now imagine if I were to steal a copy of that holograph. That would mean I can forge as many tickets as I want and the service provider is just going to let me in. That's essentially what is happening when these signing certs have been accessed and these SAML tokens or tickets are being forged. This is something we're going to talk about more in a future show, but... One thing to note here is that we're talking about it in context of the Solargate compromise. However, that's not necessarily required for this compromise to happen in your environment. So anytime you have attackers that have gained inside access to your world and they have gained a lateral movement or privilege escalation, this is potentially possible. And what this has really highlighted is the need to create separation between your on-premises environment and any cloud environments you use. Because if you have that federation trust between on-premises identity, like an ADFS environment, and you're using that for federated authentication to say Azure AD, then an attacker could forge SAML tokens that say, I'm the global administrator. And now not only has your on-premises identity been compromised, but your entire cloud infrastructure has been compromised as well. And again, we'll talk about this more down the road, but there's another really eye-opening blog post that we'll also link to in the show notes for the show that walks through creating that, that separation of your identity infrastructure from on-premises and cloud components to kind of prevent if one gets compromised from the other becoming compromised as well. And again, it's not really related necessarily to Solargate, other than that's where we kind of started seeing this more commonly for the first time as all of these organizations that were compromised through this method. This is one of the, the resulting behaviors that happened. Once the folks got inside, this is what they did with it. It doesn't have to be this way. There's, there's some steps we can take to minimize this risk. So uh, we'll talk about it more, but, but something to think about. And, and we'll link that article in the show notes. It's a post on the Microsoft Azure Active Directory blog that walks through kind of creating that separation. And there's some, again, eyebrow raising ideas in there that I don't think a lot of customers are doing today, but maybe should start. As I was reading through the article, and Adam, maybe you can provide a little bit more color because you you work with a lot of different customers. I was a bit confused at first because it did refer to an on-premise identity, which 
Alex obviously referred to for Microsoft as ADFS, but there are other identity providers who also provide on-prem identity services like ADFS. Mm -hmm. And the concept of an attacker getting onto an on-premise environment and then compromising that identity that is on-prem was a bit foreign to me because I haven't used ADFS. I have only used AD Sync, where it syncs identities to the cloud. But you had mentioned that there's even guidance from the CIA recently that says any customers who are using ADFS should migrate off. I'm just wondering, referring to the article, it almost felt like there's actually a lot of customers still on some sort of federated on-prem identity provider. Is that, in your experience, is that something that you've encountered? Yeah, let me let me clear this up a little bit because so, we're kind of talking about two different things, but but they're interrelated here. So the first piece is how do you authenticate? And we're we're talking about Azure AD, and we're really just talking about Microsoft 365 because that's obviously a treasure trove of corporate data, mailboxes, SharePoint Online, team sites uh, of all the cloud application SaaS apps you might be using in your environment. That's probably one of the most attractive. And so of course, an attacker if they can break into your on-prem environment, they want to get there too. So for Azure Active Directory, there's three different methods to do authentication, one of which is federated authentication. And that's where Azure AD is going to work with a SAML compliant identity provider to essentially do all the authentication for Azure AD. And so that identity provider, it could be ADFS, which is a Microsoft product. It could be a third-party solution. And so this is how, if you are on a third-party identity provider, like a Ping or an Okta, and you still use Azure AD, this is how you do it. You federate with that identity provider, essentially. And so there's a lot of this conversation around ADFS because kind of everything we just talked about with the forging of SAML tokens and that sort of thing. The other two methods of authentication are kind of grouped together as considered managed authentication or cloud authentication. And one of them is password hash synchronization, where you actually sync your password hashes from your on-premises Active Directory environment. They are rehashed, they are salted with a stronger hashing algorithm, and then uploaded to Azure AD. And at that point, any authentications to Azure AD happen directly in the cloud. There's no on-premises infrastructure required to do that authentication. Another method is called pass-through authentication, which involves setting up an agent that lives on your network, and it receives basically a, a secure pass package that includes the password the user provided in the cloud authentication attempt. And then that password is attempted against your on-premises Active Directory. And then it returns a go, no go kind of signal back to Azure AD to let you sign in or not. Both of those are, are more cloud centric methods than federated authentication we talked about. Anyhow, all that's to say, question was, what do I see customers using today? So initially those cloud authentication methods really didn't exist or weren't popular. Today, I'd say the majority Majority of customers are on password hash synchronization. That's very, very popular. A couple of them are on pass through authentication because they have regulatory requirements that make them do that. And then I do have some customers that are on ADFS, mostly just through inertia. Nothing has pushed them to move, but people are starting to do it because there are feature benefits to moving to password hash sync. Anyhow, all that's to say, it was the NSA who was really saying you should start using password hash sync. That was their recommendation for Azure AD. Then you also mentioned Azure AD Connect, which is the tool that synchronizes identities. So if you have an on-premises identity, it synchronizes that same identity to the cloud. So users don't have to manage a separate identity for on-premises applications and cloud applications, which is great. However, there's also guidance in the same blog post that I've referred to, we're going to link in the show notes, where it makes the recommendation that for your administrative users in the cloud, so people with elevated permissions in Azure AD or in Microsoft 365, those should not be synchronized identities. Those should be cloud-only identities that don't have an on-premises component. Because again, that's where you run into risk of even if you're using a cloud authentication method like password hash synchronization, there is still the opportunity for attackers to attempt to compromise your password. They could potentially get your MD4 or hash through some behavior as they sit on network and sniff it out. And then they could maybe compare it against a rainbow table they've already pre-calculated, or they could attempt to crack it using one of those hash cracking tools that are that are relatively fast. And so it just, it still creates additional risk there that that admin account, since it's a synchronized account, could then be compromised in the cloud. So that's where that guidance comes in of any account with LVA 
data privilege, the recommendation moving forward is it should be cloud only. Uh, again, we're just trying to create separation so that just because one thing got owned, everything else doesn't get owned along with it. And this is a shift. This is a paradigm shift because we've spent all this time and all this effort building up this hybrid identity model where you have one identity here and it kind of goes everywhere. And now we're kind of putting the brakes on that a little bit and saying, yeah, that's fine for rank and file users that don't have elevated privilege, but we don't want that for elevated privileged accounts. We don't want to have a federated identity provider that lives inside your network that if I can compromise, I can just take my, my evil plans to the cloud as well because I can just forge a SAML token and say, hey, I'm a global admin. Let me look in all these exchange mailboxes now. So that's where that guidance comes from. And, and again, we will talk about this in a future show as well. Definitely check out this guidance. And I would say me personally, as I'm talking to customers right now, I am definitely articulating that nobody expects you to be here tomorrow or a week from now or a month from now. But this gives you a state you should be working towards. You should be trying to get to. Microsoft has said in pretty clear terms that this is really a desirable state to move to. So take the guidance or leave it, of course. Customers often do leave guidance that, that we provide, but I think I would take this one pretty seriously. Well said, Adam. We're going to shift gears a little bit. In light of this week's events, we want to just to take a few minutes to discuss how politics and information security can be intertwined. So if you have had your fill of politics, you know, go ahead and switch off for a little bit. As a veteran, I was pretty shaken watching this week's events, seeing insurgents trying to derail democracy in our country. And I think no matter where your politics lie, storming the nation's capital in an attempt to overthrow the results of a free and fair election is sedition. As I was looking through like the tweets of what was going on, putting on my information security hat for a minute, I saw someone tweet out a photo of Nancy Pelosi's unlocked computer. And so it just got me thinking about every single piece of equipment in the Capitol and how that could be compromised. Reports came in later. I think the only reported piece of equipment that was stolen so far was one laptop and all Senate laptops since 2018 have been encrypted by default. Fault. So we're not sure if this particular laptop was an older one or a newer one, but so far that's the only one that has been reported as stolen. And obviously based on solar winds and everything else, we understand that the government has a lot of bigger problems when it comes to information security other than this particular incident, which by the way, were all unclassified computers. So no classified data specifically was accessed that we know of. But the funny thing is that because of how much information gets leaked from the hill, most people don't put a lot of sensitive stuff on the machines anyways. So when it comes to locking computers too, it got me kind of brainstorming where, you know, we talk about how security should be a balance between the business and security itself. And our goal is generally to try to make things secure as well as enable the business. So it should be automated or automatic. Users shouldn't have to think about it. Something like Windows Hello for Business, which we've talked about, where it's more secure, it's easier for the user to get in, and it's it's automatic. One of my friends texted me, actually, with that same tweet of the picture of Nancy Pelosi's computer, and she said, now I realize why the communications group, when we were in the military together, why that group wanted computers to be automatically locked when you removed your CAT card. That was something that they pushed on us way back in the day. People didn't like it because it was inconvenient, but it would be easy and automatic when you removed your, your identification card that the computer would lock right away. There's been a lot of interesting discussion coming out from all of this kind of it's been a, a point of contention, I'd say, on InfoSec Twitter, where I've seen people kind of argue both ways on, on some of the things you've discussed, where there's people who have been saying, you know, it's complete overreaction to say every single device should be considered compromised and thrown out. Sure, that's a theoretical risk, but there's there's so many other methods of compromise that are, are more likely or more common than somebody sneaking around during this insurrection and, and attempting to you know plug flash drives into devices or something and that's been an interesting conversation kind of back and forth over should we consider everything compromised or not and the other one the point that's been interesting and i don't know if, if this is necessarily helpful but it's it's providing context is to say who in infosec has provided support for vips for c-suite level folks 
And I personally have, by the way. So I did that in, in my past life. Uh, before joining Microsoft, one of my roles at a financial services company was I was kind of like the go-to email, mobile device administrator to go ask questions when the executives were having issues. And we all know the story around executives. They want less security. They don't want to play ball. They don't want to play by everybody else's rules. They get their own rules because, you know, who's going to stop them? And the explanation was essentially, if you think of these devices for the House of Representatives and for the Senate, you essentially have 535 executives, essentially, that kind of want that sort of thing. And, and they kind of are the, you know, the bosses of the situation in a lot of cases. Of course, there's chain of command and all that. But anyhow, it just kind of points out the challenges with why they don't have some of these policies, why they don't have auto lock, why don't they have this. And it goes back to some of these challenges that we've all faced in our professional lives for a very long time. And so some of that conversation was really interesting as well. And and then, of course, another conversation that spun up that was also interesting was there was somebody trying to shame whoever ran out of this office for not locking their screen. Or they were talking about how the InfoSec guys at, at their company, if you forgot to lock your screen, would come do some sort of harassing behavior to kind of pick on you for not following the rules. And it generated all sorts of discussions around like, what is a reasonable amount of user buy-in or user involvement in implementing a security policy, right? You have to have some technical guardrails to accomplish that. And then the other part of it is, is is just reminding that you can't be antagonistic towards your users. That's not an effective way to go about being an effective InfoSec person. And Andy and I talk about this on the show all the time. So I, I expect our listeners are all, you know, very collaborative with your end users and are not shaming them and are not picking on them. But it's also a good reminder that that is not productive either. And so so there's a lot of conversation around this. And, and it's been really interesting fodder for discussion, right? Over, yes, these are all kind of executive level people, but they still need to have these security policies. How can we implement them? What's a reasonable amount of agreement between, hey, there's literally people with guns running around here right now. I'm going to go shelter in place, or I'm going to go to a secure area, or I'm going to follow the Capitol Police who are removing me from this office. Maybe my first thought is, oh man, I should go hit Windows key L and lock that workstation, right? So uh, a lot of interesting discussion here, and, and it should really build our empathy as we think through people in very serious situations where cybersecurity might not be top of mind, but then also thinking through um, how we work with maybe challenging constituents and how we get them to buy into security as well. If there was an active shooter situation, even for someone like me who is extremely information security conscious, I think the last thing on my mind would be hitting the Windows L key on my computer. Right. I'm not going to blame any one of those users for running out. So those are all like really good points. I saw those as well on Twitter. And just finally, after the events on Wednesday, Congress went ahead and certified the Electoral College. So Joe Biden is officially going to be the next president of the United States. So just a quick note on what this might mean for tech policy, especially since just about a month ago, we suffered probably one of the greatest cybersecurity breaches in our government that we've probably ever seen. For one, Biden has already announced that he created a new cybersecurity role on his National Security Council, and he's tapped Ann Neuenberger, who is an intelligence veteran, currently serving as the NSA's Director of Cybersecurity to serve in that role. And this says to me that the Biden administration intends to elevate cybersecurity as a key national security priority after Trump eliminated the role of cybersecurity coordinator in 2018. There's probably a lot of other tech policies that we'll see out of this administration, especially now that the Democrats have control of the House and the Senate, and they can actually try to legislate some law. But Biden isn't necessarily known as a tech buff. A lot of his positions on tech policy are unknown because he hasn't really published anything, but it can go both ways on this. It's possible that he'll have some great tech advisors that will influence him in his policies rather than using his own personal views to draw a policy. He named David Recordon as the new White House Director of Technology, which is also a great promising start because Recordon's credentials is as an open source developer. But then also on the flip side of the coin, it's possible that his lack of interest in tech may also signify that tech policy may not be a priority for him. It may not be a priority, 
but at the same time, I think there's some topics that are just so big, they're good. They're going to have to come up and, and get some resolution on them. And there've been some, again, speaking to what I know, Microsoft has a gentleman by the name of Brad Smith, who is our chief legal counsel, but also kind of acts as our liaison to the government as far as trying to influence policy. And certainly Microsoft has been very loud and very open about the need for data privacy laws in our country. So in Europe, I I think most people in our InfoSec world are probably familiar with GDPR or the General Data Protection Regulation. And that has some pretty strict privacy practices that it enforces in the European Union and has financial penalties backing it up. And and they're pretty significant. So GDPR adherence is really very strong for any organization that does business in Europe. However, of course, if you don't, you don't have to acknowledge it here. And even if you do operate in Europe and also in the United States, you don't necessarily have to apply the same set of policies. So Facebook, for example, of course, must comply with GDPR in Europe, but they don't give those same protections here in the United States. You know, it might just be easier to operate under sing- one single set of policy regulation, but again, Facebook. So California did go ahead and spun up their own privacy laws. There was CCPA or the California Consumer Privacy Act which began enforcement in the middle part of this year, July 1. And they've already written an addendum called the California Privacy Rights Act, or CPRA, and that begins enforcement in 2023. Of course, that's just California. So there's been a lot of conversation around the fact that the laws we have from a data privacy perspective are really outdated really non-existent in the internet era. They just don't address kind of the risks and the the current state we live in. You know, I think of, for example, if you have a smartphone, you know, the policy is really not there to protect you as a, as a person from law enforcement kind of looking through your phone and the treasure trove of data that's on it from location information to conversations to internet activity and everything in between. And you get into really weird positions where if you have biometrics enabled on that, you can be forced to use your biometric to unlock your device. But if you have biometrics turned off and you use just a passcode or a pin that you know only in your head, then you're protected under the Fifth Amendment from having to self-incriminate. And so it discourages the usage of modern technologies like biometric authentication, which is just kind of bananas. And, And that's just one example. And then all of the collection of data, the mass surveillance from companies like Google and Facebook, we don't really have policy that addresses those. And and so it's definitely something we need at a United States level. And and maybe that's something where when you have a Democratic-led administration from end to end, from House of Representatives to Senate to White House, that's something we could have to, to regulate the behavior of these you know, big tech companies. And, and, you know, Wall Street, by the way, started pricing that in when it became clear that the election was certified and that Joe Biden is officially president-elect in all official sense and and that the, the Georgia Senate runoffs both went for the Democrats as well. Wall Street started pricing in some downside for the tech industry because they expect that things like this will come. So I think that's one highlight of, of policy that might change in a end-to-end uh, Democrat-led government and I'm sure, Andy, you can think of another example as well. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback off of the data privacy real quick because I think it'll be important not only on a national sense, but also on an international sense to maybe work diplomatically with other countries on this. Speaking from experience, the laws in Europe are getting stricter and stricter. And not only is there GDPR, but also individual nations down to individual provinces have their own data privacy laws. Some are strict enough that if you read them with a privacy lawyer, they suggest that even if it's part of the same company, data has to be stored for different employees. If you have European employees and US employees, they can't be housed in the same for example, Azure AD tenant and the administrators who access that data have to reside in that country. So if I had, for example, I'm just using this as an example, I don't know the laws specifically, I'm not a privacy lawyer, but if I had a a German office and I had German employees, that data would have to be housed in a separate tenant than the U.S. employees and the administrators who access that data have to be German citizens. Germany has been really strong on the privacy front for a very long time. 
and that's certainly the case. There's even a German-specific region for Azure services and Microsoft 365 services where it's not just in the EU, but it's specifically in Germany for that exact reason. And, and you're right, too. That's a really good point, Andy, where it's something I talk about with customers all the time. The explosion of privacy regulation is challenging because you have all these different regulations and all these different government entities from municipalities to provinces to states, to nation states, etc. And if we could come together and use the United States to lead the way on something like this with a global coalition, which sounds funny even coming out of my mouth given the last four years, but hey, you know, it's a new world now. That's, that's interesting, right? Because there is a regulatory burden here that is challenging. And especially if we could potentially adopt a lot of what California has done and, and incorporate that in there and try not to deviate from it too much, that makes the regulatory environment easier to manage while ultimately not trying to create regulatory burden, but trying to make the world a better place for individual persons and their privacy. On a personal level, one of the issues that I hope that this administration will tackle from a tech policy standpoint is net neutrality. And if you're not familiar with what net neutrality is, it's essentially the idea that all ISPs, including telecom companies, should treat all the traffic that flows through their cables and towers equally. So that means they can't slide some data into like a fast lane while blocking others or just discriminating against specific services. For example, there there are some countries that do this. Some countries allow their ISPs to, say, allow you to access Netflix, but then block you from accessing Hulu or something like that, or give you the fastest connection for Facebook, but then on Twitter, you get a very slow connection. And companies can obviously pay those ISPs to fast track their particular application. And the FCC spent years under both the Bush and Obama administration trying to enforce net neutrality protections. And in 2015, the FCC passed the net neutrality order, but in a Republican controlled FCC in 2017, they voted to toss it out. So I'm hoping that a Biden controlled FCC will revert back to net neutrality protections. I'm really hoping that Congress takes it up and passes a law which will be more binding and won't have to flip back and forth. I think net neutrality is great for consumers. I certainly would like all the traffic on the internet to be treated equally. Sometimes net neutrality can pop up in weird ways where it actually sounds something that's favorable for consumers, but it's kind of not when you peel back the onion. So several years ago, T-Mobile got in a little bit of hot water because, and, and here's how long ago this was, this was back before T-Mobile was doing unlimited plans. They first started doing a promotion where you could stream against certain music streaming services without it counting against your data cap. And so this sounded awesome, right? I mean, hey, I can stream all the Spotify and Apple music I want, and it doesn't count against me. But of course, then people go, well, what about Tidal? What about Google Music or whatever it was called at the time? What about, I, I don't even know if um, Microsoft service was operational back then, Groove. What about those? And and they weren't included. And so it, it can sound something like from a, a slick marketing perspective, man, that's awesome. T-Mobile now lets me stream all my music streaming for, for free. It doesn't count against my data cap. But of course, they're still picking and choosing winners and losers, right? And so that's a really good example of real world net neutrality action kind of several years ago now, where it even sounded positive on the face. It wasn't kind of one of one of these examples that sound like, you know, really kind of dark and sinister. It, it was painted as bright and friendly, like, hey, look at this, this is good. But still, ultimately, we like just having a pipe and I can go to wherever I want with that pipe and all the traffic is treated equally. And, and there aren't winners and losers. There aren't backroom deals. There aren't corporate synergies or any of this. And, and I agree, Andy, I, I would not only like to see a Biden FCC revisit this and bring it back, but agree as well that really this needs to be taken up by Congress and become law. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to do a lot of this, but you're right, kind of zooming out back to the original thesis of this whole conversation, since Biden isn't really a big tech 
buff and really did not campaign on a whole lot of technology reform or technology laws, I don't know how much of it we'll see. Again, I mentioned there is the expectation that there will be some regulation of big tech moving forward and probably needs to be, especially for uh, several of the big technology companies that, that aren't really privacy centric. But at the same time, I, I wonder how much of this we will and won't see. I, I do hope a lot of this gets taken up and and we're able to to move some regulation through that honestly just is going to make things a lot more standardized and consistent because the patchwork of laws is so challenging for folks in our role and for organizations. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. We'll put all the references for the articles in the show notes. If you have a security topic that you want us to talk about or have follow-up questions, our contact information is in the show notes. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.